Colossians chapter 2, verse number 8, a discerning faith. Read it with me. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ, a discerning faith. Uh, you know, everything and everyone vies for our attention nowadays. Our smart devices are really data points, if you will. Every time you open or go on or log on, it's a data point where they're profiling us. And they get to know soon all about you through the, your interests, what you like. And they know what makes you tick and what makes you click. That's what their point is, that's marketing. So when we love our smart devices, our smart devices are really programming us to follow what other people will designate for us. We're being led through our desires. And it's our senses that takes us into those places. Bible tells us to beware lest you become cheated through philosophy, through things that are empty but they will lead you astray. Things that sounds good, looks good, feels good, it's all part of the deceit. In 2 Timothy chapter four and verse number three and four, this happened because it said, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but they will have their own lusts reaping up for themselves teachers having itching ears and they should turn their ears away from the truth and shall be turned into fables, into fables. Again, we have itching ears. We like what we like. I got a caption I want to show you, different between, this is a caption of, of, of persons. We like Gucci. Look at these for a moment. You see that? This, this is the two purses here. One's fake, one's real. Like, let's look at that. Which, which, one, which one do you say is real? The one on the right you say is real? Some says one on the left is real. Okay, they're both fake. They're both fake. And the reason why I put it up there because they both look very real. And it's very discerning. Now that one, this is what a real Gucci purse looks like. Okay, that's just what a real one looks like. Did I say that, that one's real? No, I didn't say that was real, did I? I said this is what one looks like. You see how deceiving it can be? How subtle? This is what a real Gucci purse looks like, but this one is fake also. <laughs> That's how we can be led astray because we like the way things look. We like the way it makes us feel. And, it's, and that's what Satan does. He knows it's the lust of our eyes, the lust of our flesh, and the pride of life is the, is the nerve center in what makes us move. He did it in the Garden of Eden. He got there and he posed a question. He came to Adam and Eve and says, can you eat of any tree that's in the midst of the garden? And that was, a, that was a leading question because ultimately his whole point was deceit. But they started the dialogue and, and whenever someone entices you with a question, it's sometimes a loaded conversation. It's meant to lead you into a certain outcome. And its ultimate point was deceit. But if you don't have a discerning spirit and a really discerning faith, you will fall for the counterfeit. Discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. Discernment is knowing the difference between what is right and what is almost right. Sometimes we fall for what is almost right. It looks good enough. It's close. To, I, I, you start talking yourself into the counterfeit. Well, I mean, it's, nothing else has come along. This is as best I've had so far. But you know, just before God gives you what he has for you, you got to pass up some counterfeits. How many knows that? Yeah. You always got to pass up some counterfeits on your way to getting what God has for you. But if you don't have a discerning spirit, the counterfeit can look so good and so real. It's like, I, nobody knows. It, it's close enough. And sometimes when we, when we get into something that's close enough, you find out later that it's just not enough. How many knows that close enough is not enough? Close enough is not enough. That's why we have to have all of Jesus. You can't get close enough to Jesus. It just doesn't do. Some people have tried to have a close relationship with him. You got to be all in. To get everything that he has for you, you got to be all in with Jesus. 
I remember when I used to first come to this church, started coming after a while, been out there in the streets, started coming back to church. I got back in the back when I was coming to church. I wanted to get close enough. I, I sat way back. I was in church, but I was not really, the church is not in me yet. So I want to get close enough to come to church. And you can't have a relationship with Jesus when you're close enough. You got to be all in. And I remember when I decided that I wasn't going to play church anymore, that I really wanted to have this true, genuine, and sincere relationship with him. And that's when I began to know what authentic worship was like. It, you, know, you don't have to have permission to worship. The music doesn't have to move you to worship. It doesn't have to be a particular choir or band or selection of song in order to worship him. And I started to draw closer. And then I found myself from the back seat, I was sitting all the way up in the front seat. And then I wasn't distracted. And then I started applauding and clapping my hands. And at first in that church, I was the only one doing that. I would clap my hands and people were looking around like, what's, what's wrong with him? <laughs> It's, it's, exact, it's like he's having church in here or something. <laughs> but over time, praise becomes contagious. Amen. And then other people started clapping their hands. And, and then they give other people permission. And then they started praising God. And before you know it, church really did start breaking out in that place. And that's what God wants to have happen with us. He wants revival to happen. But revival doesn't happen in the church. Revival happens in the hearts of the people. When you start having revival in your heart, then God starts having revival happening within the church. It's like a fire. Whenever there's a forest fire, the danger in a forest fire is one of the animals catches on fire. And they go to a part of the forest where there is no fire and they start a fire there. Now they have two fires. And then they try to put that one out. Then another animal catches on fire and it keeps setting new parts of the forest on fire. And before you know it, the fires are out of control. The church is the very same way. At some point in church, somebody catches on fire. In the old church, there was always a mother back there. One of those church mothers back there. Preachers are preaching, choir, singing, everything's going, and then somebody catches on fire. So, oh, there goes Mother Jones. And then before you know it, my mother catches on fire. I always get embarrassed my mother would do that. Why your mama's always shouting? Because she's on fire. As, Job, as I think it was Job who said, uh, one of the prophets who said, it's like fire shut up in my bones. Yeah. And, and when you start to get on fire for Jesus, people will show up just to watch you burn. Yeah. When a church is on fire, everybody shows up. It's like whenever you see a fire in your community, everybody rushes to the fire. When fire is in you, people are going to start rushing to you because Jesus is showing himself favorable in you. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to study the word of God. And to have a discerning faith, you've got to study the word of God. You cannot just show up without being prepared. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know, if you know the truth, it's easy to spot an untruth. The Bible says you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. If you want to be free, you got to set your mind on what is true. Not what sounds good, not what you like, but know what's true. And the truth sometimes hurts, doesn't it? Sometimes you don't want to know the truth because the truth cuts real deep. And the truth is something that makes you have to stop and, and think and, and, and take a deep breath. Because the truth is not always easy. It's not always warm. It's not always kind. It's not always comforting. Sometimes the truth cuts deep. But it also heals. And if you want to be healed, you have to know where the truth comes from. The next thing we have to know of course facts versus truth. Not everything that is fact is true. Not everything that is a fact is true. You can twist facts, but you can't twist the truth. In Genesis chapter three, verse number four, the serpent said to the woman, this is the serpent saying to Eve, you will not surely die. For God knows in the day that you eat of it, it means of this, of this fruit, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. He was giving them facts, but it wasn't true. Be careful when you're, when you're hung up on facts 
when things happen in our world, we immediately go to headlines. We look for headlines, and the headline directs us into where we should go. But the truth is not in headlines. The truth is in the small print that you don't really get to just to see. Go beyond headlines. If you want to know the truth, go always go beyond headlines. Go beyond what popular opinion, go beyond the democracy. Because the truth lies in the small voice that God speaks to your spirit. The truth for you might not come from someone that you expect it would come from. Sometimes God gives a truth to someone that you may have just met. But the truth has come to set each one of us free. That's where the truth really lies. There was a scene in um, the movie Indiana Jones, one of the Indiana Jones movies, where it just take a, a step of faith. He was at this point where there was a canyon or divide or whatever, and he had no way of getting across this, but, he, but there was a puzzle or riddle about how to do this. And ultimately he had to take a step of faith. And he had to close his eyes, he closed his eyes, and he put his foot out. And as soon as he took his step, suddenly the bridge that he was looking for appeared. He was able to cross on that. That's what faith is about, is that when you don't see a way, know that God has already given you a way. Amen. It's not a way that you can see. It's a way that God gives you deep down in your spirit. And you'll never know what way that is until you take the step. We would love to be able to show us the way God, and I'll, I'll take the step if you show me the way. God says, you take the step, and then the way shows up. Yes. Because the way is in our faith. The, the step, that the bridge that he wanted to step on was always there, but it wasn't a bridge that he could see. The bridge was in his faith. And as soon as he took that step of faith, everything he believed for showed up. That's what the sermon is about. It's about not seeing it sometime and, and not sure what step you need to take, but I don't know what to do, God, but I'm going to take a step. And as you take this, the initial faith, God does result in faith. He already prepares a way for us. That's what it means to believe. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 1, 1 John 4 and 1, it says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Um, you know, false prophets are going to be commonplace, the Bible says, in the last days. We're going to be deceived. Many will be deceived. It even says, even the very elect, that means the most faithful will be deceived if God does not shorten the days. That means Satan is cunning. He's out there. But we got to know who he is. He's the deceiver. The Bible says he's the father of lies. And he knows each one of us. Satan goes around as a roaring lion studying me. He studies every one of us. He knows all of your moves, all of your data points. He knows what you're thinking. He knows your pleasures. And he will use every one of our desires to trip us up. But you got to know who he is. It's like if you ever watched a, a magic show and you've been impressed and then you find out how the tricks were done and you go back to the same show, it doesn't have any effect anymore. That's what it should be like with Satan. Once he tricked you enough times, once you've gone through his lies, once you've fallen prey to that, once, shame on me. Twice, shame on you. I think I've got it flipped around. <laughs> but you get the point. <laughs> you shouldn't keep falling to the same thing that Satan tripped you up on before. See his tricks. See his cunningness. See his deceit. And know that he's there to deceive every one of us. To kill, steal, and destroy. That's his point. And lastly, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Matthew chapter 24, verse 21. For there will be great distress, unequal from the beginning of the world until now and never be equal again. In those days, has not been cut short, not one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. At this time, anyone who says to you, look, here's the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. Make a note. Fear looks at the facts, but faith looks at God. Whenever you have fear, you want something to comfort your fear. Give me facts. Give me some information that's going to comfort the fears. But when you look to God, God gives you that peace in the midst of storms. That's what we got to rely on. 
Sometimes without any facts to support that smile on your face, why are you so happy? I'm happy because he's in me. There was a, that song, um, I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. When you're really free, that, that, when you're free of everything, a smile comes on your face because you lose the burdens that weighs you down. You're blessed going out and blessed coming in. Why? Because God loosens the shackles from you. He allows you to be free. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eyes on the sparrow. And if his eyes on that sparrow, you know his eyes are on you as well. God's all over us. In Acts chapter 17 and verse number 11, it says the Berean Jews were more noble character than those in Thessalonica. For they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. When we look at how God uses us, and we pray that God will use us mightily, but we have to be able to discern when is God speaking. As, as you're going throughout your week this week, and we talked about it earlier today, start with the first 15 minutes of your day. What happens the first 15 minutes determines your day. Give God the first 15 minutes. Open yourself up. Allow yourself to receive from him. Don't go and check that social media. Don't think about your, your coffee. Don't think about it. Just give him the first 15 minutes. Open yourself. Lord, I give myself away. Have that discerning spirit to know that had it not been for God, you wouldn't have woken up that morning. So as soon as you wake up, start with an attitude of gratitude and a posture of praise. It's him that lifts you up every day. He's worthy of our praise. So when you start out knowing that every day starts out a good day, even if your keys get locked out of your house or you have a flat tire or there's a detour, you can't get to church because the freeways are blocked off. Even though you may have lost your job, there's been a layoff, know that God is still good. Even at the beginning, God saw your end. And when you got there, you gotta say, you know something? I don't know what God is doing here, but I know God has a plan. He didn't bring you this far to leave you right here. God has a plan. It may take you a way around sometime. Sometimes God may take you through the rough side of the mountain, but in that plan, God still is with you. He'll let you know that he'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. In Psalms 91, it said that you're gonna see a lot of things happening, but don't fear the arrow by day or the, or the pestilence that happens at noonday. Other people are gonna fall, but God says, I've got you. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but none will come near you. God has got us. Keep our hand in God's hand. Have a discerning spirit that when you get there, know that God already has prepared you for the moment. Have a discerning spirit to know that God didn't bring you to it unless he's gonna bring you through it. He brought us through here nine years. Our spirits are discerned nine years ago who will be right here at this point. Even three years ago, we didn't know where we'd be at this point. But I've got, I got something to tell you. God has even greater plans for us this upcoming year. As we look around where we are right now, God has plans he's putting into the hearts of his people. The plan doesn't come from out there. He has plans he's putting into every one of us. As God implements something in your heart, discern what God wants you to do. Change from where you are. Allow God to use you to be the difference that the world needs right now. The world needs God more than ever. His light needs to shine more than ever. This world is a dark place. We looked at just what happened this past week in Florida and South Carolina and all throughout the East Coast. Imagine that one day to the next day how a life can change. It can happen to every one of us. It might not be that same type of storm, but you can have a, a personal storm that can happen that can change your life from one day to the next day. So we have compassion for everybody. I'm praying that from everything, salvation is gonna break out. That through this, lives are gonna be changed and God's gonna receive the glory because he's in the business of blessing people. How can you bless somebody through a storm? Because God controls storms. God knows there's a limit on it, what every storm can do. The storm does not have control. God controls the storm. And know that whatever limit the storm has, it stops there. And from that point on, God has a new beginning. At the end of your point for you is beginning of your point for God. Don't ever give up on him.
No matter what your world brings, no matter what your week brings, no matter what your life brings, know he's always in it. He'll never forget you. He'll never forget you. Amen. Give God a round of praise. <laughs> Almighty and precious God, we thank you for your blessing of your people here, for your precious souls that are gathered. And God, we know that right now you're in this place. We ask you to touch everyone that's right here. Everyone at the sound of my voice, somebody in here needs a blessing. Someone in here needs, needs prayer. Someone in here needs a touch right now. And I'm going to ask right now, God, that your Holy Spirit joins us, that you'll commune with us. And I'm going to ask my church family, if you do something different for us today, if everyone would come in, around this table, and we're just going to have communion around our table, so rather than everyone coming up individually, just come and gather as close as you can around the table. I'm going to pray for you. Come closer. There you go. Just close in. Yes. Everyone is here. Father God, for everyone that's here, for every need, touch right now. Calm them. Join hands with that person next to you. There's pain in this building right now, God. We ask you to touch the area of pain. Fear. Oh, God, you do not give us that spirit of fear. We, we plead the blood of Jesus over every fear that's right now among us. Indecision. Those that are going through a point of having to make a, a big decision right now. Meet them at those crossroads. Someone here has, has a life change that they're making. Let you be in the midst of that. For those that are expecting mothers, for those that are going through jobs and finances right now, every need is represented right in here in this room. As we come and join hands, God, we ask you to be in the midst of us. Bind us closer than we've ever been. Touch right now. Release it. Whatever you have right now, I ask you to release it. Let go. Let God have it right now. Whatever you came in with, I ask you to release it right now. Feel the Holy Spirit taking it away from you. Whatever it is, giving you that peace that passes all understanding. God wants to do it for you right now. You came in weary and burdened, but God wants you to leave empty and filled with his spirit. Loose it right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We rejoice right now. We rejoice right now.